Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Acton Institute, and thank you for coming to today's Acton Lecture Series event. My name is Stephen Barrows, and I'm the Managing Director of Programs here at Acton. Although many of you, if not most of you, already are familiar with what we do here at Acton, I think it's always helpful to underscore our mission statement. So the mission of the Acton Institute is to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. Now, if you go to our website, you will also see that our mission statement is accompanied by a set of 10 core principles. When reflecting on those core principles, it strikes me how important they are to building and sustaining a flourishing civilization. And this is why I'm particularly excited about the topic today in today's lecture. So our format for today is a 30-minute lecture followed by a 30-minute session for questions and answers. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our distinguished speaker. Lawrence W. Reed became the president of the Foundation for Economic Education in 2008. Prior to that, he was founder and president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy in Midland, Michigan. He chaired the Department of Economics and taught economics courses at Northwood University in Michigan from 1977 to 1984. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Grove City College and a Master of Arts in History from Slippery Rock State University. He also holds two honorary doctorates, one from Central Michigan University and the other from Northwood University. A champion for liberty, Reed has authored over 1,000 newspaper columns and articles and dozens of articles in magazines and journals in the United States and abroad. He has authored or co-authored eight books, the most recent being Real Heroes, Inspiring True Stories of Courage, Character, and Conviction. Larry has delivered at least 75 speeches annually in the past 30 years in virtually every state and in dozens of countries from Bulgaria to China to Bolivia. He is a member of the prestigious Mont Pelerin Society and serves as an advisor to numerous organizations around the world. His numerous recognitions include the Champion of Freedom Award from the Mackinac Center for Public Policy and the Distinguished Alumni Award from Grove City College. A native of Pennsylvania and a 30-year resident of Michigan, Larry now resides in Noonan, Georgia. So please join me in offering a warm welcome to Larry Reed. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate, uh, once again, the opportunity to be at an Acton event. I was here just two months ago for Acton University again, which is always uh, an annual uh, delight to, uh, to be a part of. And thanks especially for having me uh, here in Michigan in August. What a great time to get out of Atlanta. <laughs> Our founder at the Foundation for Economic Education, Leonard Reed, no relation, had a great line years ago that he used to often spark a conversation to get people interested in his vocation, namely ideas of liberty. And uh, whenever the weather was particularly bad in the midst of a snowstorm or uh, whatever, uh, people would be saying, oh, have you seen what the weather's doing? Or it's terrible outside. And he would immediately say, no, it's a great day. Every day is a great day. And people would look at him rather quizzically, wonder why he would say that. And then he would say, that's my way of showing appreciation for the fact that at least when it comes to the weather, God and not the government is in charge. <laughs> and so I'm grateful, for, like he was, for whatever the day brings. And glad that uh, as bad as the weather might be on any given day, that it's still not something that government is in charge of. Well, why study or talk about ancient Rome. It's been gone for more than 16 centuries. But I think all of you know instinctively that you don't have a society that lasts as long as this one did. It's one of the longest lasting um, jurisdictions in the history of the world and not have abundant lessons that can pour forth from that story and inform us even 16 centuries later. You know the words of the philosopher George Santayana, who said if you, those who ignore history are condemned to repeat it. So there is an instinctive desire, I think, on the part of most people to learn what those lessons may be, even if it turns out that not many people ultimately do <laughs> learn or pay attention to them. Uh, 
maybe we should talk about them all the more. Uh, keep in mind that ancient Rome, our topic today, uh, lasted, at least in the western portion, a thousand years. The Eastern Roman Empire lasted another thousand years on top of that, but it's the Western part centered in Rome that I want to focus my remarks on today. That's, that's the portion of uh, Roman uh, society that most people seem to be especially interested in and the one I think has the most lessons uh, to teach us. I've often been asked, no matter what my topic may be at a speech, what I think the most important issue is in America today, or sometimes I talk about British history and they say, what do you think the most important issue in Britain is? I always say the same answer in whatever the context. The most important issue today in this country is the same as it was in Rome 2,000 years ago. It's the same ultimately in all times and in all places. The number one issue from which everything flows and so much can be explained is, in a word, character. Character is the one thing that universally plays a major role in explaining the rise of civilizations and also a major role in the decline and the fall of one civilization after another. So I think, you know, today, you, if you were asked what is the most important issue, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, it's the national debt, or it's government spending, or it's the opioid crisis, or a few months ago, there were people who thought collusion with Russia was the number one issue. Uh, you, you get a lot of different answers to that. But ultimately, I think it all comes down, all of those things are manifestations in one way or another of the character of the people you're talking about. So character is going to play a major role in uh, what I have to say about the rise and fall of ancient Rome here. A lot of interesting parallels uh, to America. Like America, Rome rose as a republic after a revolt against monarchy. In 509 BC, uh, the Romans overthrew uh, their king uh, and his Etruscan allies from North Italy, overthrew them, and uh, at that point the Romans basically said, we're tired of one man rule, we don't like the concentration of power, so what we're gonna set up is something that proved to be rather unique in the history of the world to that date, a republic. The Romans said, we're going to make sure that power is not concentrated any longer in the hands of a single person. <clears throat> we're going to disperse it. And we're going to do that by creating two positions at the top called consul, and they will share the power that that top position will bestow upon them. And we're going to limit them to one-year terms, and the decisions of one the Romans established will uh, be vetoable by the other. So they had to come to some consensus in order to get anything done. But this was the Romans' way in the early Republic of saying no one person is going to have the kind of power that we finally got rid of in 509 BC. At the same time they created uh, that dispersion of power at the very top, they limited what those consuls could do as well as the time in which they could do it to one year. But they also created a Senate Admittedly, not the most representative body in the history of the world. It was pretty much uh, wealthy uh, families uh, in that body uh, who had a long history of service uh, in one form or another to Rome or in, in business. But they, at the same time, created popularly elected assemblies uh, and shared some of the uh, political power uh, with the Senate. They created... Uh, things that we know of today, even by their ancient Latin terms, habeas corpus uh, being a leading example. Term limits, as I mentioned in the case of the consul and other positions as well. They had a constitution, although uh, like that of Great Britain, it was not a written one, it was an unwritten constitution, but it was powerful. It was powerful because there was consensus on it, uh, it became rooted in custom, and it became something that uh, you violated or attempted to violate at your peril. Romans had separation of powers across uh, uh, various branches of the government in those early days. The establishment uh, of the Republic did that. There was something that Romans themselves called mos maiorum. They talked about it a lot. They taught it. They regarded it as, as the glue that held them together. Mos maiorum was the um, uh, 
legal principles rooted in moral principles that they shared. This is the origin of such terms as gravitas, very much a part of this most maiorum mentality, a kind, which meant a dignified self-control. Uh, fides, from which we derive the word fidelity, it meant trustworthiness, keeping your word, being honest in your dealings. These and other character traits were very much a part of what Romans thought defined them uh, as Romans and held them together, these shared values in the early years, early centuries, in fact, of the ancient republic. There was a widespread respect as part of most maiorum for the individual uh, and for his property and for his rights. This would not always be the case, but it certainly was uh, in the early stages of the Roman Republic. And in this relative, uh, this climate of relative freedom and the free enterprise and the economic sphere that flowed from it, Rome uh, rose to a greatness and a level of production and wealth that the world had not seen before. Uh, in 70 AD, this is well into the re empire after the uh, Republic fell, but it's nonetheless about the peak in terms of Roman influence. There were a million people living in Rome, in the city of Rome. Not until London in the 19th century would any city in the world uh, approach that size again. Well, to give you an idea, one measure of Rome's decline, guess how low the population of Rome got to during the Middle Ages, long after its decline had, uh, had begun. It went from a million to 17,000. You know, we talk about, uh, in this state, you know, Detroit from 2 million to 650,000. You think that's big. How about going from 1 million to a mere 17,000? Took a few centuries, but that's exactly what happened. When <clears throat> Emperor Vespasian started building the Colosseum in 70 AD also, Rome was 10 times the size that it was when Napoleon invaded uh, the city 18 centuries later. And by the way, that Colosseum, which many of you have probably uh, visited, uh, seated some 40, 45,000 people with another 20,000 uh, for standing room, uh, a monumental achievement uh, for 2,000 years ago. In 100 AD, you could travel from Egypt to France on paved roads, Roman roads, with only one currency, in one passport in your pocket. Aqueducts reached 60 and 70 miles from the countryside into uh, the city's Rome in particular. More fresh water per person arrived in Rome by aqueducts at that time than would be the case at any time in Rome later until the 1950s. It's incredible. Uh, Roman road building, of course, is legendary with portions of the old Appian Way still uh, uh, visible and travelable uh, to this day, which reminds me, uh, the only time I've ever been heckled uh, on a campus during a speech, I trust that's not likely to happen here, but it did happen uh, two years ago in April. I was at the University of Denver giving a talk on ancient Rome. I was only five minutes into it. I'd said nothing incendiary that I could think of, but I got to this uh, mention of road building, and I mentioned how vast it was that in ancient Rome the road building campaign would not be eclipsed by anything of its kind until the interstate road building campaign in the United States of the 1950s. And it was at that point, literally less than 10 minutes into my talk, when uh, a student shouted from the uh, audience, that's not true. And I said, excuse me? And he said, no, that's not true. The Mayans built more roads. And I wasn't sure that he would said Mayans. And I said, you mean Mayans like down in Mexico? He said, yeah, yeah, our professors have researched this. They built more roads than the Romans. Well, uh, I told him that that could not possibly be true. I researched it later and discovered that the Incas were the big road builders in South America, not the Mayans. And at most, they built about 25,000 miles of road, but that was 10% of what the Romans built. The Mayans were even less than the Incans. And I thought about it later. I thought, why would, the, why would that student insist on this? And by the way, there were others who piped up saying the same thing, and that was when the signs started going up, the pre-prepared signs <laughs> with all kinds of epithets, and <laughs> apparently that was the trigger for it. And uh, the best I could 
figure is that the professors may have told them that, and if so, it's probably a sad sign of uh, how rotten the political correctness has gotten in some places on American campuses. I think what, what they were reflecting was the view that, oh, Romans, they were white Europeans, we can't say anything good about them. And Mayans, they were indigenous people. So they were, they were victims of white Europeans, and they couldn't have done anything wrong uh, in spite of things like decapitations and idol worship and, uh, and human sacrifice and, <laughs> and uh, internecine warfare and subjugation of uh, enslaved peoples that characterized the old Mayan empire. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, just an interesting side note there that uh, that was uh, enough to set a number of those students off. Uh, you may have seen one of the Monty Python films in which the greatness of Rome is sort of in a backhanded way uh, referenced by John Cleese. And uh, I'll just recount this episode, but John Cleese is in Palestine around uh, the time of, of Christ, and uh, he's trying to whip up an opposition to the Romans. And he's got an audience in his home of uh, a bunch of people, and he's trying to get them all fired up to create this liberation movement, and at one point he says, uh, after all, what have the Romans ever done for us? How many have heard this or seen this episode? Okay, <laughs> and you know what happens when he says that, there's a voice in the back that says, aqueducts. <laughs> and then he says, well, okay, other than aqueducts, what have the Romans ever done for us? And then somebody else says, education. And he says, okay, other than education and aqueducts, what have the Romans ever done for us? And then it just cuts loose. People say uh, sanitation, recreation, banking, uh, roads, peace. <laughs> and then he just lists all those things and says, okay, other than all those things, what have the Romans ever done for us? It's kind of a backhanded tribute to the fact that uh, Rome had become the center of the world's wealth and had achieved levels of productivity and production and standards of living that were the envy of the world and would not be equaled in most places for a long time to come. Uh, I want to share with you, before I go into my, uh, the details and my thesis, I want to share with you some of what some historians have said when assessing why all of that was lost, why Rome declined and ultimately fell. And the first historian is one who lived uh, within the lifetimes of many of us here. He only passed away I think 20 or 30 years ago, Will Durant. In his 1944 book, Caesar and Christ, he summarized uh, what, one of the monumental lessons of Rome in this single sentence. A great civilization, he said, is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself from within. The essential causes of Rome's decline lay in her people, her morals, her class struggle, her failing trade, her bureaucratic despotism, her stifling taxes, her consuming wars. I have three historians I want to quote from you who had the benefit of actually living at that time. Three of the greatest Roman historians who wrote about the history of the civilization they knew firsthand. And the first is Gaius Sallustius Crispus, who we abbreviate, thankfully, as simply Sallust. He was both a provincial governor for Roman North Africa and a prolific writer during the first century BC. That's the century, the last century of the Roman Republic. So it's crumbling all around him on the eve of the arrival of the first emperor. And here's what he said. Ambition prompted many to become deceitful, to keep one thing concealed in the breast and another ready on the tongue to estimate friendship and enmities not by their worth, but according to self-interest, and to carry a specious countenance rather than an honest heart. That's a commentary on character, isn't it? An erosion of character. He also wrote this, when sloth, when sloth has introduced itself in the place of industry and covetousness and pride in that of moderation and equity. The condition of a state is altered together with its morals, and thus authority is always transferred to the less deserving. Does that ring a bell? Uh, 
A century after Sallust wrote, Gaius Cornelius Tacitus, who practiced law, served in the Roman Senate, wrote well enough and so much that he's considered one of the greatest historians of antiquity. Uh, he lamented the demise of the liberties of the old republic at that point and the rise of the emperors of dubious character. And he noted, lust of absolute power is more burning than all the passions. You know, if I had to identify a single character trait responsible for more destruction than perhaps any other, I think I'd say power, the lust for it. What is that? The lust for power is the desire to rule over others, to tell them what to do, to push them around, to take their stuff, to be in charge. Um, and uh, it, to, it is incredibly intoxicating. So many people who even enter positions of power with the best of intentions, so many of them find themselves corrupted in short order. This very institute, institute here is named for, of course, a man who had a famous observation about power. Lord Acton, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I always like to add my own little corollary to that, and that is that power tends to attract the already corrupted, uh, which is really uh, ever more apparent to me, uh, just uh, on the side here. Uh, I'm very concerned, as you might imagine, about the growth of government and the uh, flow of responsibility from the individual and the family and the community uh, to the central government. Well, um, one of the consequences of that is that ba uh, bad people tend to rise to the top. The more or the larger the government gets, this was true in ancient Rome, it's just as true around us today, the bigger it gets, the more corrupt it becomes because people are fighting over this increasing mass of largesse and they want to get in charge and pass it out to their friends or at least keep the government at bay and off their backs. Uh, but the more power they personally accumulate, the more it tends to corrupt their own character if they're not already uh, corrupted. So we end up, if we don't reverse this course, and we know Rome did not, you end up with the worst of both worlds, bad people managing big government. How many times have you heard good people that you'd love to see in public life say things like, oh, I wouldn't try, don't ask me to run for anything. Why would I want my name to be dragged through? The you, know, you hear that all the time, and I lament that because the very kind of people we would most want to have in government, increasingly, are the ones who flee from it because it's such dirty business. It's one of the consequences of the sheer size and scope and intrusiveness and power uh, of government. Uh, here's another line from uh, Tacitus that I think uh, you'll appreciate. It sounds almost like it came from uh, Ayn Rand, from Atlas Shrugged, perhaps, but it comes from Tacitus 2,000 years ago. He noted, as he looked around him, uh, as the Republic had just expired, he said, when men of talents are punished, authority is strengthened. And uh, listen to that again. When men of talents are punished, authority or power is strengthened. Here's another good one from Tacitus. He said, now bills were passed, not only for national objectives, but for individual cases and laws were most numerous when the commonwealth was most corrupt. What is he noting? That at one time the Republic tended to focus on doing what needed to be done for the good of all, but now he notes we're passing laws all the time and so many of them are not for the general welfare as so much as for the benefit of this group that's been pitted against that group. We're taking from some, giving to others, focusing on the here and now on a handful of uh, noisy or powerful uh, groups and giving them something special at the expense of others. That rings a bell too, doesn't it? By this time, the first century AD, Rome had degenerated from a relatively free republic uh, to a monstrous dictatorship. So its policies at home were increasingly no better than its uh, warfare policies abroad. Tacitus noted with regret in here in a place that not so long before had been a uh, bastion of freedoms of speech and press and assembly. He said, it is the rare fortune of these days that one may think what one likes and say what one thinks. Uh, noting, I think, one of the consequences of concentrating power in, in uh, central authorities. 
your basic freedoms tend to be uh, jeopardized in the course of doing that. A third Roman historian, uh, Levy, uh, lived between the periods of Sallust and Tacitus, and he authored a sweeping history of ancient Rome from its founding. Admittedly, a lot of this is it, probably legend at that point, but uh, he wrote it up anyway. All through uh, the uh, creation of the Republic, it's 500 years, and through the, the rule of the first of the emperors, Augustus. And here are some things that he said. Uh, I think if you remember the French phrase, the more things change, the more they stay the same. That'll ring true in the words of Levy. He said, men are only too clever at shifting blame from their own shoulders to those of others. Such is the nature of crowds. Either they are humble and servile or arrogant and dominating. They are incapable of making moderate use of freedom, which is the middle course, or of keeping it. And then he said, there is nothing that is more often clothed in an attractive garb than a false creed. I thought of that as I watched the Democratic debate uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I'm thinking $22.5 trillion in debt. So if you expected candidates in that debate to say how they were going to bring that under control and reduce reckless spending, you were very dissatisfied, weren't you? Instead, we heard an endless litany of promises and proposals to spend trillions more, all wrapped in this garb of, we're going to help you, we're going to take care of you, we're going to relieve your distress, we're going to take care of your college for you, we're going to give you free stuff. And of course, none of it is free. It never was in ancient Rome, nor is it today. And finally, uh, a, a great quote from Levy is as follows, the subjects to which I would ask each of my readers to devote his earnest attention are these, the life and morals of the community, the men and the qualities by which through domestic policy and foreign war dominion was won and extended. Then as the standard of morality gradually lowers, let him follow the decay of the national character, observing how at first it slowly sinks, then slips downward more and more rapidly, and finally begins to plunge into headlong ruin until he reaches these days in which we can bear neither our diseases nor our remedies. Ominous, but honest uh, nonetheless. When you examine the, uh, the last hundred years of the Roman Republic, so pivotal in Roman history, that 500 year period of the Republic is about to give way to a 500 year period of, uh, of significant less, significantly less freedom uh, and uh, emperors and emperor worship, what happened specifically? What were the events that were hallmarks of this erosion of character and how did they show up? I think there are three ways in which the erosion of character, things like respect for life and property and tradition and uh, the Roman institutions that had governed and, and given them considerable freedom before, three things took place in that last century that really uh, take them down the tube. One are the costly wars and foreign adventure. Uh, there's a great book uh, I highly recommend. It came out maybe 10 years ago by uh, historian Thomas Madden, uh, M-A-D-D-E-N, called Empires of Trust. And he draws a lot of parallels between this period and, and recent American history. And he points out that uh, Romans were rather reluctant uh, inheritors of empire at first. There were occasions, I'll never forget the story he tells about uh, the time uh, when they came, the Romans came to the rescue of the Greeks in one of their wars with the Persians. And the Romans came over to Greece, they helped expel the Persians, and the Greeks at that point figured, well, you know, we're going to be a conquered people one way or the other, now it's just going to be the Romans instead of the Persians, and they were shocked when the Romans said, no, we're, we're not here to stay. We were here because we wanted to help you repel the Persians, and now you're free, and we're going home. Uh, does that ring a bell? Uh, it's later Rome when they begin to send armies overseas for the purpose of forcibly building an empire, but they were at first a reluctant uh, center of empire. Uh, a second reason that you see really advancing during the uh, last hundred years of the Republic, uh, explaining the decline, is the rise of the Roman welfare state. 
the abandonment of personal responsibility in so many walks of life, the acceptance of the notion that government isn't simply uh, uh, a peacekeeper, it should be also a provider of more and more things. We can get it from the government and may, maybe not then have to work for it. We can vote for a living instead of working for one. You see that uh, increasingly getting hold in the last century of the republic. And then thirdly, you find a willingness to cut corners when it came to their governing institutions. Uh, you know, for the first few hundred years, if you were caught even hinting that you'd like to be a king, or you'd like to be in charge, or that you thought the Constitution was just a dead letter, you, you could do whatever you wanted in government anyway, that you did that at, at great political peril. But somewhere in the mid part of the second century BC, you really begin to see people sort of casting their constitution aside. You have Marius, who, uh, you know, you were supposed to be a consul for one term, one year. Uh, Marius comes along and convinces the people to let him be consul seven times. Not all consecutive, but within a pretty compressed period of time. Because each time he said, effectively, you really need me, I'm important, I know what's best. I know the Constitution says I can't do this, but that's, you know, that's kind of old. So let's not worry about that, let's do other things. And you see that time and time again, the respect and reverence for the institutions that had kept the power of government limited and the uh, freedom of the individual um, uh, solid is increasingly sort of cast aside. You see it in the form of uh, the rise of the grain dole, which also begins in the 140s BC. At first, uh, uh, the uh, members of the Senate uh, and consuls thought, well, we can buy the support of the men in the military by giving them uh, grain subsidies. And the problem with every welfare state is once you, once you abandon the notion that government is to serve all people equally and begin to regard it as a fountain of free goodies for whoever is the noisiest. The problem is, where do you draw the line? Because once you say, okay, this, th this group of people, they get a lot of goodies, then you have other people who say, well, why, should, why shouldn't I? I'm important. Why should I pay the bills so they get all the goodies? And so increasingly you find the grain dole expanded to where at the time of Julius Caesar, about 100 years later, near the end of the Republic, he finds when he comes to power that a third of the people of Rome are on the grain dole. And he tries to cut it and, and briefly is able to do that, but uh, within a few years it's back up uh, higher than it, than it ever was. If I had to be asked, well, what one event would you say uh, marks the end of the Republic to be followed by that 500 years of increasing tyranny we know as the empire? You know, some historians would say, well, it was uh, when Julius Caesar was named by the Senate uh, emperor for life. Uh, I wouldn't agree with that because that only lasted a month uh, <laughs> until he was assassinated. And there was a chance, because the assassins were friends of the old republic, there was a chance maybe uh, some lost freedoms could be restored and power might not be concentrated in one man. But of course that wasn't to be. Mark Antony maneuvered to succeed Caesar and to make himself uh, emperor for life. Uh, other historians would say, well, maybe 27 uh, AD, 43 I think, or 44 was when Caesar was briefly named emperor for life. 27 AD, or I'm sorry, BC, is another important year because uh, that's when uh, Augustus becomes the first emperor. Uh, but I think an event in between is, I would say, is the, uh, the actual death of the Republic. And I'm referring to the assassination of the Republic's last great defender, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Cicero, great man, friend of liberty, enemy of the state. He had been uh, a very successful lawyer, worked his way up through all the positions of any significance in Rome, became consul for one year. During that time, he snuffed out a conspiracy to overthrow the Republic, the Catiline Conspiracy. Saved Rome, was named the father of the country, given extraordinary powers briefly for that job. He could have kept them and said, well, you really need me like Marius did. But one year was up and he walked away. He gave up power in defense of uh, the Republican institutions he revered. 
Uh, Caesar tried to convince him to join a triumvirate and share power. He refused. He denounced that kind of thing. Uh, later, Mark Antony entertained briefly the notion maybe he could talk uh, Cicero into joining uh, something similar. Cicero not only refused, he went to the Senate as a retired politician at that point, delivered 14 speeches, you can read to this day, called the Philippics, 14 speeches in which he denounced Mark Antony as the greatest danger of Roman Republican liberties. He was a tyrant in waiting. Uh, and that's what prompted then uh, Mark Antony to send an assassin for him. And it was in December of 43 BC when the assassin found his mark and uh, beheaded uh, Cicero. It was all downhill from there. Uh, with the coming of Augustus, you, he's the first emperor. He kind of retained some of the trappings of uh, the old republic, but he really is in charge. And in subsequent emperors will toss aside most of those pretenses as well and gather ever more power to themselves. I want to close with just a few important events in that empire period that underscore how the problems that led to the republic's decline only worsen under the empire. I mentioned the welfare state. In 91 AD, Emperor Domitian, in an effort to uh, raise the price of, of uh, wine, orders the destruction of half of the vineyards in various Roman provinces. Sounds like the AAA of 1933 to me. Uh, you also had a period in that first century AD where there was a financial crisis and the Roman government responded by issuing massive quantities of loans at zero interest. And about that time, shortly thereafter, with the pressure so great from Roman spending uh, and all these loans and so forth, the Emperor Nero begins the process of debasing the currency of Rome. I mean, how do you pay for all this stuff? They're going to war for all kinds of reasons. They're throwing dole at uh, all kinds of people. They're putting people on, uh, at the, on the public payroll. Well, you, you can raise taxes, which they did, but ultimately the pressure to cheat on the currency is so great, Nero begins the process. The denarius was 94% silver at the start of Nero's reign. Within 200 years, the silver content of the currency had fallen to 0.02%, just a speck of silver. The rest was cheap junk metals that they had flooded the country, or the, the empire with, uh, causing a cyclonic superinflation. Those are the terms of a historian named Max Shapiro. He talks about a cyclonic superinflation of the fourth century when prices were soaring at the twinkling of an eye, value of Roman currency falling through the floor. And guess what they did in response to soaring inflation? Do you think they said, oh, well, we better balance the budget and quit uh, uh, ripping off people through eroding their currency? No, the Emperor Diocletian in the year 301, you can see this at the Smithsonian, they have an exhibit that uh, reproduces his famous edict. He issued a comprehensive wage and price controls under penalty of death in the year 301. Uh, the economy, uh, what was left of it, crumbled uh, fairly quickly. And Rome was never but a shadow of its former self after those years. And by 476 AD, of course, uh, Rome fell like a ripe plum. That's the year that uh, barbarian invaders entered the city of Rome itself, found many of the people actually welcoming them figuring that, hey, whatever they do is better than the tyranny of our own tax collectors, uh, and welcoming uh, foreign barbarians into the city, heralding the end of the Western Roman Empire. I hope I've said enough to prompt some questions. I've kind of summarized a lot of years of history in a 35 minutes. But uh, with that, I'll, I'll close and uh, open it up to some questions. Yes, ma'am. Let's oh. give a round of applause for Mr. Reed, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll now have about 20 to 25 minutes of Q&A. So if you'd raise your hand and wait until my colleague or I come and hand the microphone to you, because we have people watching on live stream and they would also like to hear your question as well. So we can, time for questions now. Good afternoon, I'm Joel Engel. I'm running for Congress in the third district in uh, Hi, Joel. A little political speech. You, you, you helped me <laughs> I'm out glad with a lot you were in stuff. the front row. <laughs> yeah, I know. A lot of the things you were saying really rings true. Um, 
I'm just curious about your take on social media and how it's uh, affecting our oh. lack of accountability in our society today. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm increasingly worried that, especially in the light of these uh, mass shootings, and you have to ask yourself, what is causing uh, so many young men to do these horrendous things? And increasingly, it's apparent that uh, there's a common thread. Uh, they're disconnected. Uh, they're, they're low, often loners, often very active in social media. And you look at social media, what's that become for so many people? It's a place where you can, if, if anonymously or, or at least without immediate and obvious reprisal or having to face somebody eyeball to eyeball, you can attack, you can condemn, you can be uh, viscerally rotten and nasty. I see it all the time on social media and get away with it. So uh, social media in some ways has been a real boon, but there is this downside and, uh, that is not helping. It's contributing to the disconnectedness, the anonymity, the go off on your own and, and you know, uh, uh, that is contributing to the uh, dis disintegration of the bonds that once kept us together. What, how to deal with it? I don't know. I might be very skeptical of the government passing laws to try to deal with it. I think, again, these things, the answer is more likely to be found right in here uh, in a renaissance of character, a revival of uh, respect for the individual, one person, one parent, one child at a time. Uh, maybe we have to have even more crises before we face that. I don't know. But uh, it does worry me a lot. It may not be a definitive answer, but I, I think it is part of the problem. Can you speak to the social issues that were occurring during uh, the decline of Rome, specifically abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, the use of the IUD, the loss of uh, the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm? Can you speak to what was happening at that time? Uh, a little bit. I tend to concentrate more on the political and economic. Uh, but I know that infanticide, even in the late republic, uh, was an issue, whereas it wasn't earlier. Uh, uh, of course, a big social issue is slavery. And although Roman, uh, Rome always had some slavery, that becomes a more acute issue uh, with time. In fact, in those... Uh, wars of the first century BC, the declining decades of the Republic, slavery becomes an, a, a, an ever bigger issue because as they start to conquer just for the sake of conquering or for the revenue, uh, often the troops would be paid in various gifts, including slaves, conquered peoples they'd bring back. And that actually had enormous negative impact on the economy. It put a lot of small farmers out of business. Uh, because they're having to compete with the free labor that uh, now these other guys, they get free land for maybe their service or a general pays them off with a chunk of land, keeps, their, keeps them quiet and gives them a few slaves and now they're competing head to head with enterprising small farmers. That, that led to a lot of economic dislocation and class, class conflict. Uh, the other matters of, of abortion and uh, uh, other things you mentioned, I'm, I'm not as well versed on, so I, I can't uh, comment further. There is a, a good book, I, I think, does get into that uh, by Jeremiah Johnston with a T, not like the uh, old movie Jeremiah Johnson, Johnston with a T. And I forget the title, but if you go on to Amazon and type in his name, it deals with the uh, 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 last hundred years of the Republic and a lot of the social decline. Uh, some of those things are, I think, in that. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Mike Farage. I, I've been a fan of yours going back to the Mackinac Center. I've oh, actually, to this day, I ran for local office. I stole a lot of your rhetoric for about unfunded <laughs> liabilities. Um, uh, something I just, it's just a question, I, and it's, it's kind of related to what we're talking. When... Um, the city of Grand Rapids has over a billion dollars in debt. When I was addressing this to some of the people when I was running, I, I noticed when you talk about unfunded liabilities that half the audience fell asleep. Yeah. And it's like a huge concern. This is debt. This is, yeah. what is it that just, I don't know, it, 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 is it not a political sexy enough? Or is it, what is it that doesn't, that people won't resonate to, 
debt when you're talking basically it's coming out of your pocket yeah. and be alert on it and like you know they'd rather talk about you know a carnival or something mm -hmm. yeah thank you mike uh, for what you first said as, as well i appreciate it lucky for you i don't copyright anything so <laughs> um you know maybe it, uh, before i put much blame on on the folks we're trying to reach maybe maybe we don't communicate clearly enough in a way that they can relate to just how serious this is. Me, uh, often I see people on our side of the fence who talk about things like debt and the green eye shades come on, you know, and they, it's all dollars and cents instead of putting it in terms of what is this doing to real people? What, what are we doing to children and grandchildren? Uh, maybe we need to uh, borrow uh, something that the other side uses all the time, often uh, in an unjustified way, a little emotion and talk about, hey, if this doesn't interest you, well then, you need to shake your conscience up a little bit. Why doesn't it interest you that your children and grandchildren may find themselves so burdened with the debts of your bills that they may not, they may not uh, make it in life? They may be saddled with huge burdens because of what we're doing today. Doesn't, why doesn't that light a fire under you? Maybe we just need a little be, to be a little bit more you know, in their face and some of the rhetoric in a polite way to get them to realize how serious this stuff is. This is mortgaging the, the future of your kids and their kids. That, that should light a fire under you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, how are we deciding? I guess these guys are picking the hands. I so. have a question for you. You, you so, sort of started to address it already, and that is, do you have hope for the future? What can uh. we do to build this better character within our mm. culture and those kinds of things. You started to address it. Yes. Oh, thank you, Anna, for asking that because if you hadn't, we might have ended on what could have sounded like a pessimistic note, and I'm not a pessimist. Uh, I think you have to be optimistic. Uh, no, first of all, nobody knows the future, right? Do you know exactly what's going to happen a day from now, let alone six years, 60 years? I mean, we don't know the future, so why get down on it even before it happens? Um, and if you are pessimistic, if you think all is lost, that uh, we just have to go the way Rome did, uh, and there's no turning around, well, then a couple bad things happen. You stop working for what you know to be right, or you don't work as hard for it because you kind of have given up, you know? Nobody works as hard for something they think is lost than they do for something they think is winnable. So you gotta convince yourself that good people can make a difference. Doesn't matter what the odds and the obstacles are. We can change, we can change the course of history. It's happened before. And the other bad thing that happens if you're pessimistic is that other people then don't wanna hear your message. If, you, if I came here today and said I wanna sign you all up to work for things like liberty and a revival of character, but by the way, we're gonna lose this, you'd all say, well, I might as well just go along for the ride, you know? <laughs> Why bother? Get what I can while I can get it. Um, so f for the sake of the future, you need to muster an optimism. And uh, whatever, I've had occasion to uh, debate and to have interaction on public forums with people of a very different persuasion. And I love using this tool. If you can't get, say, a socialist, to actually turn around and realize, no, that's a bankrupting philosophy, doesn't go anywhere, it's never worked, and that kind of thing. If you can't quite get them to acknowledge any of that, well, just smile and say, well, it's only a matter of time, you're a smart person. You, at some point, uh, you'll see this. A lot of socialists do. I know a lot more former socialists than I know former free market people. <laughs> I really do. Did you ever run into anybody who said, you know, I used to think that uh, individual responsibility and freedom was the way to go, but now I think we need to empower government bureaucracies. I think politicians should run our lives. Nobody, nobody goes in that direction. So uh, I think Karl Marx, you know, kind of understood this. I have a feeling, uh, nobody knows this for sure, but he's known for coming up with his doctrine of inevitability, you know, where he said, oh, it doesn't matter if you don't like what I have to say, even if you're opposed to the communism I'm promoting, it doesn't matter, it, history is heading in that direction, it's just gonna happen, so you might as well sit back and, and forget trying to oppose it. I think he understood that that would be a disarming thing, that he, could, he might help win the future for his side if he could simply disarm uh, opponents. We need to turn around 
turn that around and use it on our side, that if there's one thing that may be inevitable, it, surely it is that people will be what God intended them to be, and that is free and sovereign individuals, people of character who make choices for their lives. Um, I think using that as a tool uh, can be helpful in the battle of persuasion, but I am optimistic. I don't know when things may turn around, but I think uh, it's always important to work for good people to work for what they know to be right. If for no other reason than for the sake of your own conscience, don't you want someday when you're about to check out to be able to look back in your life and say something like the Apostle Paul did on the night before his martyrdom when he said, I have kept, I have run the race, I have finished, wait a minute, he was a lot more eloquent. Uh, uh, Run, fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't you want to be able to say that? That you, once you knew what the right thing was, you didn't give up on it? So uh, always be optimistic. We don't know the future, but we do know that if we don't work for what we know to be right, it can't possibly be a good one. I have an observation and a question. The observation is that for an insight into the angry white young males, uh, the book uh, Alienated America by Tim Carney uh, gives some uh, insights. Okay, the thank you. The question is, uh, do you view the U.S. interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan as the kind of uh, foreign interventions and empire building that uh, you allude to as being one of the causes of the downfall of the Roman Empire? Mm, good question. Uh, I'm not a foreign policy expert, uh, but I'm uh, much more sympathetic to the original intervention in Afghanistan, given that was the origin of the 9-11 attacks, than I am of the uh, war against Iraq. Uh, I, I think the war in Iraq was a mistake. Uh, Afghanistan is a little more justifiable. Uh, there are other interventions that are much less justifiable. Sending troops to Somalia a few years back, and uh, you know Woodrow Wilson started this business in a big way. Uh, he invaded one country or another in Latin America something like 15, 18 times. I forget the huge number. We kind of forget that, but uh, the source of a lot of the anti-Americanism in Latin America goes back to Wilson's time, where uh, you didn't have the communist empire to say we got to keep an eye out on what they might do in our hemisphere. You didn't have that. You just had these little local uh, revolutions and, and fusses that I don't think were really part of our uh, uh, duty to get involved with. That, so that's how I'd handle that. Afghanistan, I, I, I think, was justified. I'm not sure if 18 years of being there is justified, <laughs> but uh, the initial invasion was. You mentioned a lot about the um, economic history of the empire, the Roman Empire. Is there a source that you would recommend that kind of, I, I don't want to say summarizes it, but actually documents and you know, gives the information? Yeah, there are several. Uh, first of all, if you go to the FEE website, FEE.org, and type in, say, in the search engine, Rome, and maybe my last name, Reed, very quickly, maybe the first item will be something called Are We Rome? And there I've listed with links uh, 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 quite a few resources, books, articles from a lot of places. So that's, a, that's a, in a single place, a lot of uh, what you're looking for right there. In terms of actual books, is a, this is a little hard to find these days because it's old, but you can still get it on eBay, I know. H.J. Uh, Haskell, H-A-S-K-E-L-L, -L, wrote a wonderful little book uh, 60 years ago called The New Deal in Old Rome. <laughs> and as you might imagine, he was drawing parallels with what he saw in the 1930s and what um, Rome did. That's a good one. Uh, more recent, uh, Mike Duncan. Oh, he's a fascinating historian who writes for a lay audience, and it's uh, fun reading. The Storm Before the Storm. And it's a history of the last 150 years of the Republic and the period I'm mostly focused on here. His stuff is always good. Michael Grant has written a lot. Uh, his stuff's OK. Uh, so those come readily to mind. But that single page at fee.org will give you a lot of sources. <laughs> 
being a great historian. You being a great historian, Larry, um, if you could spend 24 hours with a deceased person mm. other than Jesus Christ, which would be an obvious choice, who would it be and why? Oh, thank you, Chuck. That's a question I've often asked. In fact, I wrote about this very thing in uh, my uh, writings on Cicero, so I'll, I'll pick him. He's always on my list. Uh, I've asked myself many times if, uh, I, you know, if I had to pick 10 people, who would they be? And Jesus is always one of them. Cicero is always one. There are a few others that kind of go in and out. But Cicero is, is one because uh, uh, he was just such a great man, so, so pivotal. And even though he didn't succeed, you might look back and say, well, it was, everything he did was in vain. He lost, lost his life as well as the Republic. But he gifted us so much. Uh, his writings are, you know, we have more of the original writings of Cicero uh, in existence than we have of, of those of anyone living before 1000 AD. The guy was not only prolific, his stuff still survives, a great deal of it. Uh, I would love to have time with him just to ask him, what was it like as you saw your country crumbling all around you? And what motivated you to be so courageous and outspoken when you knew they could take your life in a moment as they ultimately did? He would be one. Another one would be uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, I don't think I'd have any questions for him. I'd just say, just, Leo, just talk. And I'll just, <laughs> I'll just listen. I don't care what you say. He would be one. Uh, Joan of Arc would be another. Uh, Oh, it's an endless list, but Cicero will be right at the top. Currency devaluation is in the news. Um, what successful ways have nations dealt with and come back from serious inflation and currency devaluation? Oh, uh, that's a great question. It's on my mind right now because uh, uh, in uh, January, I have to go to uh, Ecuador to speak on this very subject because it will mark first week of January marks the 20th anniversary of Ecuador's successful dollarization. Now, it doesn't work for everybody, but in Ecuador, they had uh, before, if you go back 21 years or so ago, they had inflation that was approaching 100% a year. Not anywhere near as high as the 2 million percent in Venezuela right now, but still 100% for a developed, reasonably developed economy was quite uh, the threat. They reversed it by dollarizing, by saying, well, you know, instead of going to say a gold or a new Ecuadorian currency, we're just gonna, everybody's using dollars anyway in Ecuador. Uh, so we're just gonna make the dollar our currency. So now if they have inflation, it's because we have inflation. But we've had so little that for 20 years, they've had uh, inflation in low single digits just like we have instead of something approaching 100%. Um, that isn't a permanent answer because it's so dependent upon you know, another country, what it does. But uh, it has proven to be helpful, very helpful for, and other countries have done something similar. Um, I think the best ex uh, example in my life, no, not quite my lifetime, just before, uh, Germany, post-World War II. Uh, Ludwig Erhard became uh, finance minister. Uh, this would be about 1948. And uh, uh, Germany had, uh, of course, was flattened, devastated, demoralized, occupied, divided, and also uh, ripped apart with hyperinflation, which the Soviets uh, were largely responsible for. They were given the task of maintaining or pr making sure there was currency for uh, Germany after World War II, and they had an interest in keeping Germany weak. So they, they uh, were inflating the currency. Erhard got in charge, and all of a sudden, on a Sunday night, went on radio, and um, uh, even though he had not consulted the American occupying forces or the British or the French, he did it on his own to our, over our objections. He announced on radio that the next morning there would be no more price controls, no more rationing, and a brand new sound currency, the Deutschmark. And he said, we're not gonna inflate it, we're gonna have balanced budgets, we're cutting taxes and tariffs, we're freeing up the economy, and uh, what do we call the next 10 years? the German post-war economic miracle. And it was largely on the foundation of a sound currency, a Deutschmark, not uh, convertible into, say, a precious metal, which I think is often the ideal, but at least it, with st strict limitations on how much the government could print. And, and uh, 
uh, on a, with a sound currency and a freer economy, Germany went from defeated and devastated to the richest country in Europe again within a decade. Um, so those, and you know, in American history, if you think, hey, hyperinflations only happen elsewhere, they don't happen here. We had two hyperinflations in American history. One was the continental dollar in the early years of the American War for Independence. We printed, you may recall the old phrase, not worth a continental. We printed paper, we put Ben Franklin in charge of the printing presses, for crying out loud. <laughs> and he said, okay, we're only gonna print six million dollars worth. And several hundred million dollars more later, uh, they had to restore convertibility uh, to gold. And we started winning battles by that time because we were paying an honest money. Then the second time was in the American South, when partly because they lost and partly because they printed too much, the Southern Confederate currency went to zero. The Northern greenback currency was cut by two thirds in value. We had runaway inflation in the North as well. But both times, the result ultimately was a restoration of a gold backed currency. Congress actually passed a law in 1875 called the Specie Resumption Act that said, beginning on the 1st of January, 1879, they gave themselves four years, they said, every greenback we've printed will be backed by gold and not at a fraction of what we first promised, on par what we promised at the start of the war. And they gave themselves four years to make sure the gold reserves were sufficient to do it. And bingo, when the convertibility day came, do you think people rushed to the banks to claim gold for their paper? They didn't. And why? Because they had confidence. Congress had done what it promised. It salted the gold away, promised to redeem. They were ready to do so. People said, okay, as long as it's as good as gold, I'll use the paper. So we've had restoration of sound currency after hyperinflations even in this country twice. Let's give a hand to Mr. Reed. Oh. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.